Hi friends, uh, this is Gary and Kathy. We've uh, been through a lot this past year in 2017 and really the story began quite some time ago but we wanted to share with you our testimony of what God has done over these last several years and culminating on August 10th uh, 2017. Yes, it was about five years ago now that Gary was diagnosed with NASH and we thought we'd just take a pill and get over it, but it wasn't quite that easy. Um, actually, it was a death sentence that the doctor had given Gary. But you know what? We serve a great God, and we determined that no matter what the circumstances or what the situation, what we see or what we feel, we're going to trust God because He is our healer. He is the Lord God that heals us. Amen. You know, and we discovered through this whole process that uh, there's some things that whatever challenge you may face, whatever situation you may encounter, whether it's health, uh, relationships, finances, direction, or just finding value and purpose in life, there's some principles that we've discovered through this process that uh, we believe brought us through and uh, we wanted to share those with you today briefly. Yes, I, I think one of the greatest principles that we used was trusting the Word of God. You know, there's so many voices in your life. Try this and try that, and uh, I think this will get rid of this symptom or that or the other. Everybody has an idea what's going to help. But, you know, we go to the Word of God, and God's Word declares that He's redeemed our life from destruction. He's forgiven all of our iniquities, and He healed all of our diseases. So we trust in the Word, and um, even though some of it might have been good advice, we decided we were going to follow the directions of the doctors, but we were going to trust in the Word of God. Amen. And um, it has just been an awesome Miracle after miracle, really, hasn't it, honey? Yes, it has. And uh, we, we, the Word uh, works. And we wouldn't want you to think of our experience as being a template for you. But there's principles uh, that through our experience that we really believe that uh, it'll help you at whatever you situation you may encounter. Right. You know, and I, and I come back to the Word because every night we were confessing the Word of God over Gary and uh, choosing to believe in God's Word because God's Word said, my words are spirit and they are life. And we knew we needed life and abundant life that God promised. So, um, and then too, God said also He would watch over His Word to perform it. And so we wanted to uh, hold on tightly to the Word of God during this whole process and believe His Word is true. And it certainly has been true for us. Um, there's been the very first miracle after moving here, uh, well, just the process of moving to Florida was one, but after moving here, uh, I wanted Gary to go to Mayo Clinic. And our insurance company said, no, that's impossible because Mayo is out of network. And so I put that aside and the doctor had made arrangements for us to go to another hospital uh, closer to our location. And uh, even though I was disappointed, I said, okay, Lord, Gary's in your hands, whatever you want. And um, I'll never forget the day, it was in April, about April 8th, um, the hospital called and we want a, an hour consultation with Gary at the end of the month. I said, fine, we'll be there. And I'll never forget, about 15 minutes later, Mayo Clinic called us. And I said, who is this? I can't believe this is Mayo Clinic calling. I said, we did not apply to Mayo Clinic because our insurance will not cover Gary. And they said someone had told us wrong that my, our insurance is definitely going to cover us. And they wanted to see Gary in three days at Mayo Clinic for three weeks of evaluation. And that started the whole process. You know, uh, some of you may not know, but uh, we were diagnosed with NASH, which is non-alcoholic cirrhosis uh, hepatitis, which is what NASH stands for. And it's a liver disease. We've never been told what caused it. Uh, we have suspicions, <laughs> and that's one of my primary gifts, is suspicion. And, but uh, Kathy, why don't you just share a little bit about uh, NASH and some of those 
experiences. Yes. Okay, uh, NASH come to find out is, is a very evil disease because um, it affects the liver and the liver is so vital uh, of an organ to your whole body and to every organ in the body. So the first thing we noticed is that Gary was swelling up quite, quite largely in the belly and so he would have to go and have the belly drained quite often of the liquid that would build up because um, the liver was not getting rid of the toxins that it needed to get rid of. And then um, shortly thereafter, Gary was diagnosed with diabetes because the pancreas lies right under the liver and the, the sickening liver had affected the pancreas and so he was diagnosed with diabetes. And then the next thing we knew is that Gary was developing kidney problems and uh, the kidneys could not handle all the toxins in his body. So uh, he had kidney failure. And then the next thing to go, which surprised me so much, is that uh, he developed varices in his esophagus. And uh, the doctor came out and he said, you know, I'm not so concerned about the liver now as I am about the varices. He said, because Gary, he said, if those varices rupture, and they're kind of like varicose veins um, in the esophagus, he said if they rupture, you have 45 minutes to live, maybe an hour. He said, so wherever your travels take you, make sure you're close to a hospital. Which really uh, ended our traveling ministry, but uh, God was faithful, amen? Amen, he was so faithful. And so uh, all through all through this process, though, you know, God's word was a, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It encouraged us. It gave us hope. It just revealed to us the great love of Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us. And it just uh, reemphasized the fact that we're his sons and daughters. He loves us a bunch, a bunch. And he cares about everything that touches our lives. You know, uh, there were a lot of physical symptoms and um, all of that was going on. Some of it was funny looking back on it now and others of it that's, are, were really grateful that the Lord intervened and, and God gave Kathy a special grace during that time. Yes, I think one of the, the uh, very last symptoms was that the toxins began to make its way to the brain. It was called encephalopathy. Yes, I do have a brain now. You can find <laughs> that out. They called it encephalopathy, and it, it's where uh, actually you do things and you don't know what you're doing. Um, you're just kind of out of it. I remember one time um, I came out of the bedroom, and Gary was pulling on the mirror hung on the wall, and I said, what are you doing, honey? And he says, I just can't get this door open. <laughs> so many silly things, but... It could have been quite serious too. One time he thought we were still living in Ohio and, and he was trying to get me to turn the car around and grabbing at the steering wheel, trying to make me turn around to go back to Ohio to where our house was, he thought. <laughs> well, you know, there were a lot of different things, but through all of that, we found out if you will hold on to the Word of God, yes. heaven and earth are going to pass away, but His Word remains. Right. And uh, so we want to encourage you, whatever it is that you're challenged with, whatever you may be challenged with, or maybe you know someone that's challenged by something uh, during this special season, encourage them to hold on to the Word. Yes. See, this season's all about the Word being made flesh, and Jesus came that we might have life. Yes. But guess what? He's not a baby anymore. Amen? <laughs> He's not a baby anymore. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And uh, we're just really grateful. So hold on to the Word. The Word isn't the letters that are a certain format and a certain uh, style or even color. But the Word is a living Word. And His name is Jesus. Mm -hmm. So hold on to the Lord. But also devour the written Word of God, the Logos of God. And it'll become life to you. Uh, one of the things that we made a decision, a conscientious decision, uh, was to choose life rather than to choose uh, death 
or to allow death to overtake us. Yes. And we had sometimes, we had people saying to us, uh, not so much to me, but uh, to Kathy, we had people recommending that they put me in hospice, and uh, I just recently found that out. But you know what? I'm glad Kathy didn't make that decision because emotionally, I'm not sure how I would have responded to that. But hold on to the word. You know, see, everybody's got a word. Everybody's got a word. And as Kathy said, most of them are well-meaning. But hold on to the word of God. And when somebody speaks to you and that resonates with your spirit, that that's something from God, grab a hold of it. Yes. Uh, another thing that we found that we couldn't really have gone through had it not been for us being able to hold on to one another. Yes. And uh, holding on to my wife and her holding on to me uh, was so special. You know, the book of Hebrews says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves, as is the practice of some, and even all the more as you see the day approaching. Well, I, I'm not sure when the Lord's going to return or I'm going to go to meet Him, but um, I do know this, that uh, I need my wife, I need my children, my grandsons, I need my friends and extended family, my brother and sister, and their families were so special to us, as well as Kathy's family. You know, we really need one another. And when we have one another, we can go through anything, anything at all. That's right. You know, we receive so much encouragement from our church family. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes they would come and visit. Others would come and pray with Gary throughout the day. And uh, it's just such a blessing to get those cards in the mail and letting us know that, they're praying and they're standing in faith with us for complete healing of Gary's body. Amen. You know, uh, talking about holding on to one another, during one of the phases a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, we were in New Jersey and uh, I had an attack and uh, I told Kathy, I said, I can't, I can't handle it. I've been declaring the word, but I just, I have to, I, you got to get me to an emergency room. And so, we didn't know where to go, but I'd remember seeing a hospital nearby the hotel. So we drove to that hospital, and uh, and we didn't know who we could call at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And, and a friend's name came to mind that I, I knew lived relatively near to us, and uh, John and Elaine Franco. And uh, so we called John, and John came right away over to the hospital and spent the rest of the morning with us and, and asked Kathy, where are you going? Yeah. Where are you staying? Yes, he wanted to know where I was staying. I said, "Well, we're staying at a hotel down the road," and he said, "No, no, you're going to come home with me and stay with me and Elaine, and I'll take you back and forth to the hospital every day, but you're not going to stay in the uh, in the hotel. You're you're coming with me." So for a whole week, while Gary was in the hospital, John and Elaine, what a awesome, wonderful couple that took us in and just ministered love and God's word to us. Amen. You know, and Jim and Sylvia Miley mm -hmm. uh, came alongside. There are apostolic leaders of the team that we're a part of with Faith Covenant Ministries. They came and uh, several of the pastors, uh, Scott and Valene Netzel came and I was supposed to speak at their church that Sunday and obviously couldn't make it. And uh, we were able to uh, they came and they were just a blessing to us. Um, and so after I was discharged from the hospital, we had to wait around for a while so I could regain my strength to go back to Denver. We were living in Colorado at that time. And, and uh, shortly thereafter, I had another attack and ended up in the hospital for a week. And uh, uh, John found out that we were there. And uh, he called me on the phone and he did this for three months every day he'd call up and he'd say Gary are you ready for your prescription and he would just declare the Word of God over me even after we got out of the hospital and we were home recovering and and he would just declare the Word of God over me and uh, and do that for 20 30 minutes and then he'd say I'll I'll call you tomorrow with your prescription Gary and uh, he was so faithful to do that again Jim and Sylvia were in Denver and they came and and uh, an Anglican priest friend of mine uh, Father Phil Eberhardt and uh, Pastor Scott Cheatham he he came and visited us along with our daughter and uh, son-in-law Walter and Renee 
and and the boys came up too, uh, Zeke, Josh, Gary, and Sam, and and God was just so faithful. Our son flew in from uh, Dallas and spent some time there and and helped Kathy around the house. And our daughter Shonda was uh, living overseas at that time, and she called every day from Turkey to check up and see how we were doing. And and God was just so faithful. But through this all, people were there to rally around us. And during the last few months of this um, warfare, um, it was just really, really tough. And yeah. um, we finally did get accepted uh, to go on uh, the list, the transplant list at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. Yes, can I say this, honey? Uh, to be accepted and to get on the list, he had to go through a series of evaluations. And it seemed like there was one attack after another. At first they said he would have to have a, a liver transplant and a kidney transplant. But we had people praying and seeking God. And when we went for the evaluations, the kidney transplant doctor said, no, I think you're going to do all right. You don't need that. And then they said, well, he might have to... Uh, have a catheterization because he had so much plaque in his arteries and we prayed we sought God people stood with us Amen. and he went and his arteries were clear enough they didn't think it would be, be a problem for him to get a liver transplant but even at that Mayo Clinic uh, figured up how much money we would need to have the transplant and it, it came up to fifteen thousand dollars cash that we would have to have and prove that we had in the bank in order for them to do the transplant. Now, we want to make sure that you understand that wasn't so much a demand from Mayo for them because the insurance covered uh, the, the transplant, but the cost was for a year's worth of medication, including any rejection medications. Um, it included our housing, included our meals included uh, transportation, uh, all of those things that they figured uh, for us where we lived here in Bellevue, Florida, uh, to drive back and forth to Jacksonville would be about $15,000. So that's where that figure came from. Yes, and, and plus we did have, um, what do they call it, co-pays. Co-pays on some co of the transplant. On, on, the, on the medication and on the hospital. So we had to prove to them that we we had that amount, and we didn't have that amount, <laughs> but uh, Gary um, put out uh, an, an email. Something I knew wouldn't work. <laughs> and we just trusted God, and we said, God, we need this amount of money for him to have a transplant. And we didn't know where it would come from, but we had people that loved us, people that sent money, and we had $15,000 at the end of two weeks. Um, and uh, uh, at least enough to suffice and, and to prove to uh, Mayo Clinic that we had it. And we were just praising God for it. Um, it. It was really shocking to Mayo Clinic how fast uh, the money came in. Yeah. And uh, every time we thought we had crossed a hurdle, we found another hurdle. And we just kept trusting and believing the God, in God. But, you know, it was during that time that... Uh, we, we just knew we had to depend upon the Word, but we also had to depend upon friends and, and family members. And, and so multitudes of people were responsible for us being able to see not only the financial need, but the emotional and the spiritual need. Uh, during that three-week evaluation, uh, we immediately said yes to Mayo that we'd be there. But after we hung up, uh, Kathy said, Three weeks? How are we going to do three weeks in in Jacksonville and and be close to the clinic because appointments started at seven in the morning and ended at five in the afternoon and so we said how are we going to pull that off and so I put out an email blast. This was before we sent the request for money. I just shared uh, pray for us. We're going to Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville for three weeks and. Uh, later that day, after I sent out that email, uh, pastor friends of ours, Ronnie and Ruth Thomason from uh, Cornerstone Church in Jacksonville, they called us and said, uh, listen, we don't want you to spend any money in a hotel or in restaurants. Uh, we want you to come and stay with us, and our church will take care of all of your food and all of your other expenses. And It was just kind of a 
mind-blowing experience and and to see the love of um, Pastor Shaw who we started in ministry with back in the last half, last half of the 70s uh, he drove down from Jacksonville to Bellevue and uh, spent a whole day playing his guitar and uh, praying over us and and being in constant contact with this uh, Jim Miley and other people in FCM uh, Jason Britton and Pete Thompson and Joe McCutcheon and others would call and and just check up on us and uh, uh, and our pastor uh, Randy Gideon's at uh, the warehouse church here in, in Central Florida Leesburg uh, uh, I was so sick one time I texted Randy and I said I didn't ever think I'd ever say this Randy but I'm so tired, I'm so weak, I just don't know how much more I can handle of this and because I can't even, I, I, it would make me sick, literally sick, to even read the Word of God. And I said, I can't read, I can't even really pray because of the pain. And uh, Randy called, texted me back and he said, you don't have to, we're going to stand with you and for you and fight with you and for you. And it brought a real relief and uh, to me and a sense of uh, appreciation again for, for people and our children were just uh, incredible during that whole time and uh, being able to, to see them but uh, on August 10th that morning I, I got up and I, I told Kathy I said honey if we don't get a miracle I said we, I said, we need a miracle because I don't know how much more of this I can handle and uh, that was on a Thursday morning and I just said I don't know how much I can handle and we just agreed Lord we need a miracle today and uh, at noon I was getting ready to bite into a sandwich that Kathy had fixed me and I wasn't eating very much at that time I'm making up for it now though uh, <laughs> Uh, they called and said we think we have a liver for you and uh, it was just phenomenal and so we rushed around and we went up there and and you know through this whole thing we found that people were standing with us uh, some of our friends Paul and Diane Castile amongst many of them down here and Sonia Shear and others in the church Leo and just I, if I name, start naming, I'm going to miss somebody that I don't want to, but uh, people just rallied around us and, yes. and, and our pastor friends here in Florida. And it was just incredible, but they called and uh, we thought it was going to, it possibly could have been a dry run where we'd get up there and the liver wouldn't fit or the something, the liver was damaged by the donor, but we got up there and it, uh, we arrived at about 3.30, quarter to four, something like that. And uh, by the time they got us up to the floor, it was after four o'clock, and uh, the doctor, the surgeon came in and said, we need to have this man ready by five o'clock so we can get that liver in him. And uh, when we wheeled me into the ward, I mean, everybody, it was like a, a, an army descended upon us and asking Kathy questions and plugging me up with IVs and blood tests and all kinds of things uh, that were going on and the last thing I remember uh, well tell them about Dr. Kroom honey oh. about the blood test oh well when we got into the room the nurse explained to me she said usually this is a 24 hour preparation but we're going to do you in one hour <laughs> because the liver was there and it was already prepped and um, so one nurse was taking blood, one was uh, doing um, EKG, something like that. Another nurse was on the uh, screen and the, uh, the transplant doctor came in and said, I need to have the blood work and all the blood results done by five o'clock. The nurse said, that's not possible. Uh, they, can't, they, they can't do that. They're working on other things right now. And, it's going to be impossible to get the results and he says no it's not and he grabbed the vials of blood and personally hand delivered them to the lab and within 10 minutes they 
all his results of blood work were showing up on the screen. We had another transplant doctor come in and watch the screen and he was telling me um, what was going on in his body. He says, you know, your husband was sicker than he thought. He was a lot sicker than he thought. And we knew he was very sick. And the last two months, he couldn't keep anything down. He, he, um, he ate very little and he, honestly, uh, one person said, he, that man looks like a skeleton. And it broke my heart because he did. He just couldn't even keep anything down. And it was helping him from the bedroom to his chair and from the chair to the bedroom. It was about most he could do. But you know, I'm so grateful for this, for this man because he didn't give up hope. He never lost hope. Uh, the Word of God just, it, it helped us to hang on to hope. You know, without hope, uh, a lot of people give up. They give up the fight. But with the Word of God, it, it spurred our hope on that God was going to work and do a wondrous thing in our lives. And um, a lot of people, you know, give up so easily. But he didn't. I, this man, it was amazing. He'd get up every morning and take a shower and dress himself as best as he could and get going for the day. And it was just amazing to me that he would keep doing that in spite of all the pain and the difficulties that he was experiencing in his body. When they wheeled me in for surgery, the last thing I remember thinking was, uh, they're gonna wheel me out in about an hour and tell Kathy that, uh, Miss Hines, your husband doesn't need a transplant, he's got a brand new liver in there. Well, they wheeled me out. It was about five and a half, six hours later. I did have a brand new liver. It didn't come as we were hoping and expecting for. Uh, but uh, we're alive, thank God. Yes, and God. we pray on a regular basis for the family of the donor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't know who that is, but uh, we pray for them, and especially during this season of uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and the New Year. But uh, the Lord just really blessed us, which brings me, Kathy kind of gave it an introduction there. The, the third thing, besides holding on to the Word and holding on to one another, I want to encourage you to hold on to hope. Or another word is expectation. What's your expectation? Yeah. What's your expectation? I want to encourage you to expect. And what is it that you're expecting that hasn't taken place? Uh, I had to see 23 doctors and specialists when we were going through the process and then one of those sessions uh, uh, I had to meet with a psychiatrist and people are saying well that was many years too late <laughs> I know Kathy said amen to that under her breath but seriously we we were uh, we were there in the psychiatrist office and and uh, it wasn't as intimidating as I thought it would be but the the psychiatrist was really direct and uh, he said to me he says why do you want to live? I don't know if you've ever thought about that question. Uh, but uh, I said, you know, I want to I want to grow old with my wife. I we've got a, a hope that when our 50th anniversary comes, we can walk on the beach in Maui. Yeah, we're going to uh, we're going to do it. <laughs> uh, I want to see all my children um, become the men and women of God that God's destined them to become. And I want to see my six grandsons, Ezekiel, Joshua, Gary, Sam, Malachi, and Micah. I want to see all six of those guys. I want to see them get graduated from high school. I want to, I want to see all six of those guys graduate from college and get married and have children. And I want to hold their children. And the doctor, the psychiatrist, looked at me and he says, I believe you, you've got some things to live for. I said, yes, I do. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, seeing our six grandsons, I just, I kept that vision in front of me. And I kept seeing Kathy and I walking along the beach and realizing that maybe it was Jacksonville Beach <laughs> instead of Maui. But yeah. it was really, uh, you know, keeping on to hope. The Bible says that when hope's deferred, the heart grows sick. Uh, but you see, when we, when we hold on to hope, in fact, the Bible says that without 
uh, without hope, faith doesn't work. Uh, faith works by hope. Uh, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Years ago, I asked a dear friend of mine, Dale Everett, I said, Dale, I said, who's an incredible healing evangelist, and I said to Dale, why is it that some people die? And you know they've got faith, and uh, it just doesn't seem to be working, and, and they, seem to, they seem to just really deteriorate quickly. And he said, right away, he said something that I've always remembered, even up, especially during these last few months. He said, Gary, it's not an issue of faith, it's an issue of hopelessness. They've lost hope. They've lost hope in the Word. They've lost hope in life. They've lost hope in...